This video was brought to you by our streaming service, Nebula, where you can get exclusive TLDR content like our debate on Johnson's successor. And I barely slept last night making this video, so your support is very much appreciated. Yesterday morning, the head of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady, announced that 54 Conservative MPs had submitted letters of no confidence in the Prime Minister and therefore that Boris Johnson would face a no-confidence vote at 6pm yesterday evening. Yep, it really was that tight a turnaround. So in this video, we're going to explain what caused this rebellion, what happened in the vote, and why, despite winning, this still isn't ideal for Johnson. But before we get into the news, a tiny bit of context. As you probably already know, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been beset by scandals for the best part of a year now, something that's led to a collapse in his poll ratings. But Johnson, ever the optimist, seemed keen to stick it out and made clear that he wouldn't be voluntarily resigning. So if people did want him out of office, they were left with two options. A majority in Parliament could remove him, but considering that the Conservatives had a significant majority in the Commons, this was never likely, leaving only one option on the table. His own party could remove him. When it comes to that, the Conservative Party rulebook states that if 15% of sitting MPs, currently 54 MPs, send letters of no confidence to the 1922 committee, then an official no confidence vote is triggered. In this vote, every MP gets to cast a ballot for or against the Prime Minister, and if the Prime Minister fails to win a majority in this confidence vote, then they're kicked out, and the party then holds a leadership election, in which the Prime Minister crucially cannot run again. Anyway, since the Partygate controversy really kicked off in January, we've seen endless rumours that Johnson is approaching this 54-letter threshold. But given that the number is always a secret, we never really knew for sure. Some did suspect we were getting close, but Johnson seemingly hoped that the war in Ukraine could cover him, and that the Sue Gray report would draw a line under the mess. But unfortunately for Johnson, Sue Gray clearly wasn't the end of Partygate, and Conservative MPs had apparently decided that they'd had enough. In fact, since the Sue Gray report was published a couple of weeks ago, a slow but steady trickle of letters had been going in to Sir Graham Brady, and by the time that Monday morning rolled round, some 25 MPs had publicly stated that they'd sent in letters. However, it seems that other MPs were just as unsatisfied, but a little less willing to be public about it, because yesterday morning, Brady announced that they had indeed hit the 54-letter threshold, and as such, that a no-confidence vote would be held that evening. So the big question here is why now? Why not when the Prime Minister first received a fine, or was referred to the Privileges Committee, or when the Conservatives performed poorly at the recent local elections? What's pushed MPs over the edge now? Well, it's probably because party gate clearly isn't going away at this point. Previously, Conservative MPs hoped that the Sue Gray report would mark an end to party gate and Boris-related scandals more generally. But unfortunately for both Conservative MPs and Johnson himself, this isn't how things turned out. A few days before the Grey Report was even published, new photos of Johnson at another event were leaked to the press, leading to new questions emerging about why the Met Police hadn't fined him for attending this event, which other more junior staff members were fined for attending. Then there were also allegations that Carrie Johnson's birthday party wasn't being investigated, a report from Johnson's own ethics advisor suggesting that Johnson hadn't abided by the ministerial code, and outrage over Johnson's rewriting of the ministerial code to reduce the potential sanctions for ministers who break the rules. And all of these controversies emerged even before the House of Commons Privileges Committee began its investigation into whether Johnson had misled the House, something which probably won't be finished until October, and very likely could stir up more chaos. So, you get the idea. Partygate isn't going away, and this has spooked some Conservative MPs, because it's really hurting their polling. A large-scale MRP poll from YouGov last week found that the Tories are on track to lose 85 out of the 88 seats that they won from Labour in 2019, 
And a poll from the Wakefield by-election found that the Conservatives are 20 points behind Labour in the Red Wall constituency, that they won with a 3,000-plus majority only a couple of years ago. Conservative MPs have also become increasingly anxious about the government's lack of direction when it comes to policy. The government's recent announcement about imperial measurements was widely ridiculed as an unserious attempt to distract from Johnson's political struggles. And while the new windfall tax funded £400 energy grant is a popular policy, it was first suggested by Labour, making it a somewhat embarrassing U turn for the government, and one that's especially irritated some of Johnson's more fiscally conservative colleagues. So, it's clear that a number of Tories were unhappy with the current government's leadership, and maybe more pressingly, were concerned that Johnson's leadership might make their re-election less likely. But were enough MPs concerned to swing the needle? What actually happened in the vote last night? Well, it turns out, no, there weren't enough. Because, as was widely expected, Boris Johnson survived the vote, with 211 votes expressing confidence in him and 148 expressing no confidence. In percentage terms, this means that 58.8% of the parliamentary party still have confidence in their leader, allowing Johnson to stay in number 10. Now, while this does mean that he's safe in the immediate future, it's not quite the cause for celebration that some of the front pages might have you believe. The Mail and The Express might be hailing this as a major victory, but fellow Conservative papers, The Telegraph and The Times, seem to have a better grip on reality. Because history suggests that this isn't a good result for Johnson. For instance, Theresa May won a vote of no confidence with 63% of the vote in 2018, and yet still ended up leaving office less than six months later. In fact, Johnson's ally, Jacob Rees-Mogg, immediately called for her resignation, despite her actually performing better than Johnson. Going back even further, Thatcher won by a similar margin to Johnson in 1990, and gave up the reins within just a few days. The only Conservative leader who survived a no-confidence vote in recent years was John Major in 1995, who won it by a much more confident 66% but still went on to be hammered by Tony Blair in the 1997 general election. Essentially, Conservative leaders rarely survive no-confidence votes, and the fact that Johnson has done worse than May and Major, and barely any better than Thatcher, certainly doesn't bode well for him. So, if Johnson's looking weak, then what happens next? Well, Johnson is kind of protected at the moment. And that's because the 1922 committee has a rule stating that once a leader wins a no-confidence vote, another one can't be triggered for at least 12 months. However, much like the UK's constitution more generally, 1922 committees are basically just conventions, which can easily be changed if the Tory party decide that they want their leader gone. Previous 1922 chairmen have made it clear that the 12-month rule can be scrapped if Conservative MPs feel it's, quote, an impediment to their proper function, which, again, doesn't bode well for Johnson, and that force field might not be as impenetrable as he once hoped. That ultimately means that further challenges to Johnson's leadership, whether it be explicit or implicit, look likely in the near future, and as such, History suggests that he's unlikely to survive the next six months, let alone lead the party to victory, or even another election. Now, that doesn't mean that Johnson's going to lay down and die. After all, Johnson came out shortly after the result and declared it a major victory. But in reality, he's looking about as weak as he ever has. That's because Johnson survived and even thrived as the Conservatives' leader exactly because he looked like a major vote winner. And to be fair, he's even delivered on this, securing the party's biggest win in decades. However, with approval ratings falling, and even many Tory voters wanting him gone, it's hard to see how he has the same electoral pool that he once did. Given a big chunk of his own parliamentary party wanted him gone, it's hard to imagine him facing re-election at this point. When challenged, how could he defend against the fact that many of his own MPs don't even believe in him? And in Scotland, how can the Tories stand a chance when the Scottish Conservative leader voted against him? So it seems that while Johnson might have survived this vote, the threats to his leadership likely don't end here. 
with many encouraging him to consider his position as May and Thatcher did before him. Johnson may be unlikely to hand over the reins as easily, but he's clearly damaged and heading into a worrying by-election. And as such, it's probably wise for the Tories to begin assessing who could be next. So TLDR writers Zach, Ben, Nelson and I sat down to argue over who the next Conservative leader could be after Johnson, and it got heated with each team member submitting their top five potential candidates and defending it to the group. So if you want to check out that full discussion, then you can find it exclusively on Nebula. As you likely know, Nebula is a streaming service that we've built with some of our creator friends, including all of these awesome people that you probably already watch. And if you do sign up, you can watch our full discussion about the potential new Tory leader, but you'll also get tons of other exclusive TLDR content, including our team's recent attempt at the British citizenship test and even a tour of our new office, as well as all of our videos being ad-free. If you're interested and you do want to sign up, then you'll want to use the link below to get the Nebula Curiosity Stream bundle deal. Here's how it works. If you sign up to Curiosity Stream, home of the best documentaries online, then you'll also get Nebula included absolutely free. That means for less than $15 a year, you can get both services, Curiosity Stream for the high quality documentaries and Nebula for the bonus TLDR. Doing so gets you more content and really supports the channel. So thanks for your help. And now I think it's time for me to go to bed.